living and dead who did these things, we dedicate this program... The Dam Busters. Presented by the author himself, Paul Brickhill. Dramatized by Morris West. An Australasian radio production. This is Paul Brickhill speaking. While 617 Squadron were carrying on their private war against Germany by striving to perfect their precision bombing technique, some of their methods were being adopted by other formations. Harris had sent 600 heavy bombers against the secret weapons center at Pinamunda, and they had followed Guy Gibson's lead by having a master bomber circle low and direct the other planes onto the choicest targets. The result was devastating. However, after the second raid on the anti-oil viaduct, Mickey Martin's crews were more concerned with their own failure. They flew disgustedly onto Bleeder in North Africa and sat miserably in the mess trying to work out what had gone wrong. Well, that's the second time we've had a crack at that damn viaduct and still we missed it. Well, the bomb site. Ah, oh, look, Mac, the bomb site's okay. We've tested it so often in training, we know the damn thing works. Uh, the, the real problem's the target itself. Well, look, Mickey, from 20,000 feet, a viaduct is mighty small. Now, the best results we ever got in training were an average error of 38 yards. Now, that puts us right off the target anyway. Now, I say it again, Mickey, the target's got to be marked, pinpointed with flares. Well, I'll put it up to the AOC, but... Well... He thought we wouldn't need it. Well, put it up to him again. He's not unreasonable. Okay, Mac, I'll do that. Uh, any word on Yasmin? No, Mickey, all the homing reports are in. I'm afraid he's had it. The interceptors must have got him on the home run from Bleeder. I'd better drop a line to his next of kin. Well, come on, Mickey, cheer up. Ha have a beer. No, huh? no, thanks, man. I'll see you later. I want to try and make an appointment with Cochrane. I checked it with all the other boys, sir. On small targets, we definitely need flares. Uh, fair enough. The boys are doing well to get near misses at 50 yards, but I agree. Uh, it, it's not accurate enough for pinpoint targets. Uh, here's what you do, Martin. I'll get on to Pathfinder headquarters and tell them to expect you. You and Sam Patch go over and talk over the problem with them. You'll find them very cooperative. I'll do that, sir. Um, any more operations coming up? No, uh, not for a while. Uh, you get the boys back onto training with the SABS. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm dreadfully sorry, sir. This is the third time I've messed up an operation for you. I'm due to be relieved shortly. Perhaps it's a good thing. I wanted to talk to you about that, Martin. Uh, I am relieving you, but... Uh, well, not because you've made a mess of the job. You haven't. Uh, I, I'd like to tell you that nobody, nobody could have done better. Nice of you to say so, sir. Who's the new man? Cheshire. Do you know him? Cheshire? But I thought he was a group captain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he was. But now, at his own request, he's taken a step down to Winko in order to get back on operations. Keen type. Very keen. I think you'll like him. He'll be coming down to the station in a week or so. Spend as much time as you can with him and help him to get to know the boys. I'll do that, sir. Oh, by the way, we lost one crew. You'll know that. Yes, I heard about it. Uh, the last one. Uh, any reports on him? No, sir. He took off with us from Bleeder on the home run. The fighters must have picked him up off the Spanish coast. I, uh, I've written to the next of kin. Mm -hmm. Good man. Oh, well, that's all for the moment, Martin. Um, 
By the way, you may be surprised when you meet Cheshire. You'll probably be more surprised when you talk to him for the first time. But don't underrate him. He, uh, he looks like a parson, uh, talks like one sometimes, and he has dreams like Barnes Wallace. I, I see what you mean, sir. Sounds quite a boy. I'll be looking forward to meeting him. Hey, Mickey. Hmm? Hey, have you seen this new guy, Chazier? Yes, Mac, but uh, you better keep your voice down. He's liable to be here any minute. Oh, he looks like a professor. You know what I mean. Far away, look, slight stoop, gentle sort of a voice that doesn't mean very much. Have you taken a look at his record? Yeah, that's what I mean. Two tours, a DSO and bar, DFC, honors degree from Oxford. <laughs> and you know who he's married to? Sounds though you've done some solid investigation. You Constance tell me. Constance Binney. Constance hmm? Binney, the film star. She must be at least 15 years older than he... Yes, uh, keep it, Mick. Here he comes now. Oh, uh... There you are, Martin. Well, come and have a beer, Skipper. Uh, Skipper, this is McCarthy. You've heard of him. I have indeed. How are you, Mac? Well, nice to know you, Skipper. Would you uh, like to meet the other boys, Skipper? Oh, uh, uh, don't make a thing of it, Martin. I'll just drift around. I uh, rather dread this sort of thing, you know. Always feel like a goldfish in a boat. Uh, oh, uh, there's your beer, Skipper. Oh, oh uh, thank you. Well, then. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Hey, I've got it. I've been trying to think of it all night. What, Mick? The skipper here. I remember reading about him. He's the guy who walked from Oxford to Paris without a cracker in his pocket to earn a pint of beer. Oh, is that so? Oh, I say, come off it, chap, sir. You don't want to give me a bad start. There's only one good thing about it. If you have to bail out over France, you'll know the way home again. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see you for a moment, sir? Hmm? Oh, yes, of course, Corporal Lehman. What's the trouble? It's the new CO. I'm his driver, you know. Yes, I know. What you don't know, apparently, is that for the last three days I've been sitting in the car outside his office waiting to drive him wherever he wants to go. He doesn't seem to know I'm there. He just walks past with his eyes on the ground and goes wherever he wants to on foot. Doesn't he like me or something? <laughs> I don't know, Corporal. Uh, why don't you ask him? I'll do that right away. I'm sick of being treated like a piece of equipment. Uh, come in. I'm Corporal Lehman, sir. Oh, and what can I do for you? I want you to know, sir, if you have any complaints about me. Well, well, no. It isn't exactly the sort of thing one says to a woman, but... Well, to be quite candid, I didn't even know you existed. I've been sitting outside your office for the past three days, sir. Good Lord, have you? Where? I hadn't noticed. In the station wagon, sir. Your station wagon. I'm your driver. Your what? Your driver, sir. As CO of the squadron, you have at your disposal a station wagon and a driver. Good Lord, I had no idea. And you've been... <laughs> well, you... Well, you poor girl, I... Well, I, I'm most dreadfully sorry. It seems I've got a lot to learn, doesn't it? Well, sir, you could save a lot of boot leather. Well, so I could. So I could. Well, I, I tell you what. If ever you see me walking where you think I should be driven, uh, suppose you give me a hail... It'll be much easier that way. Well, I, I'm forgetful, you see. I <laughs> think I didn't even know I had a car. Good Lord. I've got some news for you, Wallace. Oh, have you? Good or bad? 
I don't know. You know the results of our raids on Pinamunda? The rocket factory? Yes, I saw the photographs. The result of those raids has been to put back German rocket production at least six months. But it doesn't solve the problem of the launching sites on the French coast? No. Hmm. However, it's the opinion of the experts, not necessarily mine, that we should stop work on this earthquake bomb of yours. Oh, oh, dear, dear me. Hmm. After all this work and organization. Yeah. It, it's such a waste, my dear Cochrane, such a criminal waste. Well, what I'm telling you, Wallace, is not official yet. I, well, I thought you should be forewarned. It's very kind of you, Cochrane. But I hope this doesn't mean I'm to be involved in more long-winded discussions. I'm afraid it does. Yes, I might have known it. Look, Cochrane. We set out to produce this bomb with one end in view, namely to smash the locket launching sites, to to pierce the, the underground storage areas, to strike at the mechanism which controls the launching of the projectiles themselves. Mm -hmm. We agreed there was no other way of doing it. You've got to have a bomb capable of piercing 30 feet of ferro concrete. You can't get away from it. Whatever the experts say now, Cochrane, they'll have to come back to our original plan sooner or later. Yes, I realise that, Wallace. However, I can only make suggestions. I'm in no position to, well, dictate policy. Oh, I understand that, of course. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, I suppose I shall have to talk to Harris and some of the others. Oh, by the way... You could save me a lot of trouble if you'd um, sort of uh, prepare the ground for me. Well, I'd be happy to do that, Wallace. But, uh, well, uh, I'm afraid you'll have to make some sort of uh, compromise. What sort of compromise? Well, instead of the monster bomb that you're working on now, would it be possible to work on a slightly smaller model, say, uh, over 12,000 pounds, uh, still with the same principle, namely the piercing of concrete installations and the production of an earthquake blast. Yes. Yes, that's possible. Well, if you'd work on that, uh, let me have some facts and figures, I'll prepare the ground for you with uh, Harris and some of the others. It's uh, the best I can do. You know, Cochrane, when this war's over, they'll have to set up a new chair in the universities. Hmm? What sort of chair, Wallace? Elementary diplomacy for backroom boffins. <laughs> <laughs> We're so very helpless when we have to deal with people who can't read a page of figures. Of course, 617 Squadron knew nothing about Wallace's struggle to have his monster bombs accepted. They probably would have been far more satisfied if they had known their future was to be linked with this important scientific development of the war. As it was, they settled down disgustedly to more training, ruthless, incessant training that was to make their bombing the most accurate that had ever been known. But there was some relief from the tedium. They had a new CO and Leonard Cheshire's methods were unorthodox and enthusiastic. <coughs> All right, chaps, relax a while. This isn't a formal briefing. You'll get that later. It isn't even a squadron op. The crews in question will be on loan to another headquarters. However, I, I, I want to give you a few facts which may be useful to you. After all, you will be representing 617, and I'd like you to put up as good a show as possible under the circumstances. There'll be four crews. Yours, McCarthy. Yes, sir. Yours, Clayton. Yes, sir. The other two will be Bull and Whedon. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. You'll take off tomorrow morning at 0900 hours and land your aircraft at Tempsford. Oh, yes. uh, in case you don't know... 
Chemsford is the base for all sorts of hush-hush operations. The uh, parachuting of agents into occupied territories, the dropping of arms and supplies to resistance groups and other such pleasantries. <laughs> Sounds as though it's going to be sticky. It could be. First of all, the weather's chancy. It's December now, and you know what that means. I for grand snow and everything in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, well, that's about the size of it. The next problem is that you'll be coming in onto a blind target. Maybe a valley tucked away in the mountains. It may be a field or a, a vineyard. But I thought the resistance boys always marked the dropping places. You know, flashing torches or lighting fires. Oh, that depends entirely on the area. If it's free of German troops, okay. If not... I see what you mean. That puts it up to the navigator. <laughs> yes, well... The reason you've been chosen for the operation is because of your experience in low flying. There's only one thing I'd like to say to you, and it's this. An operation like this is darned uncomfortable. But if you feel like grousing about it, just think of the people all over Europe. Little groups of men. Women and children, too, for whom you are the only lifeline to freedom and to hope. They hear your engines and they say, we're not forgotten. The British are over again. They go in daily and nightly fear of the Gestapo. They, they risk everything to go out and pick up the packages you, you drop to them. They risk their own necks to hide and care for the unknown agent whom you drop out of the sky. Um, ours isn't an easy job. But at least when we come back, we can relax in free air. Well, that's, that's all, chaps. Take-off time, 0900 hours tomorrow. I... I wish you luck. Well, that's the oddest briefing I've ever heard. He's an odd guy, but I like him. Yeah. Yeah, I like him. Navigator, Captain and Navigator. Hey, look, I'm as blind as a bat in this fog. Can you give me a fix? Navigator to Captain. We're over target area, all right, Skipper. But uh, I can't give you anything close enough to drop by. Okay, okay, I guess that's it. Better give me a course for home. Wireless up. Give me RT, will you? You're on, Skipper. This is Topaz Leader calling all Topaz aircraft. This is Topaz Leader calling all Topaz aircraft. Dropping area is obscured by fog. Repeat, dropping area is obscured by fog. We are going home. We are going home. Report, please. Report, please. Over. This is G for George reporting, Skipper. Over. This is A for Apple. Skipper reporting. Over. This is Leader calling P. Popsy M. Mother. This is Leader calling P. Popsy M. Mother. Report, please. Report, please. Captain and the crew. Looks as though Bull and Wheaton have had it. We're going home. Give me a course, navigator. Oh. You're very punctual, Wallace. I came as soon as I got your message, Sir Wilfred. You know what I want to see you about. I've, uh, I've had some correspondence with Cochrane laying out uh, your point of view, and... Uh... Oh, excuse me. Uh, come in. Oh, Harris. Uh, Kevin, take a chair. Hello, Freeman. Wallace. Uh -huh. Some delay in getting here, I'm afraid. Traffic moves at a snail's pace in London these days. Well, Wallace, 
Was Freeman told you? Oh, I was, uh, I was just beginning to explain. Well, the fact is, Wallace, this ten-ton bomb of yours has been discussed at great length in the highest quarters. The Prime Minister, the Minister for Aircraft Production, and, and we all agree that the targets are not sufficiently large or important individually to justify all this work and diversion of effort. Since we raided Pinamunda... I know it... what happened at Pinamunda... <laughs> But the fact still remains that sooner or later the Germans will have their rockets in production again. And you'll have to do something about the launching sites. You know that they're too strong to be greatly damaged by ordinary bombs. Uh, yes, um, yes, we, we do know. Uh, we've been over that at great length. But uh, you see, the crux of the problem the is... The problem that... is this, Wallace. If our Lancasters are going to carry a ten-tonner, their cruising range is going to be cut down enormously. Well, it's little more than across the channel and back. Well, you see that, of course. I do see it. Very clearly. But I would like you to consider my alternative proposition, which is to continue with the manufacture of earthquake bombs, but to to reduce the size, say, to, say, 12,000 pounds. Well, the Air Council doesn't like the idea. They'll like it even less when the rockets start falling on London and we can't hit back. Hmm. You're a very thorny fellow to deal with, Wallace. I'm sorry, Sir Arthur, but I'm a scientist. I don't like half-truths, no matter where they come uh, from. S Sir Arthur, I'm inclined to agree with Wallace, you know. Um, if we could scale down this new weapon of his, we, well, we, we would be able to extend it to targets well inside Germany, and uh, it would then be an economical proposition. Mm -hmm. Could be. Could be. I'd like to think about it some more. Well, anyway, I have to leave, you know. There's a cabinet meeting this afternoon. I have a report to make. You two just carry on and see if you can get any more light on the situation. And... Oh. Good day, Wallace. Freeman. Oh, good day, Sir Arthur. Good day, Sir Arthur. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> uh, he isn't very easy to get on with, is he? But he has the greatest admiration for your work, my dear Wallace. I can assure you of that. He, um... He has the oddest way of showing it. Hmm. <laughs> uh, now, look, Wallace, I'm going to do something now that I have no real authority to do, but, um... Uh, well, I may burn my fingers, but that's better than having London burn about our ears again. Yes, Sir Wilfred? I'm going to authorize you to proceed with this scaled-down weapon of yours. I won't issue any official orders, but I'll stand by you at any inquiry that may be made. Is that good enough? It's very, very good indeed. And uh, when will you have the model ready to test? By the middle of March. Good enough. Let's name it now, shall we? All right. We'll call it, um... Tall Boy. Come in. You sent for me, sir? Yes, Mickey. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Looks like it. You, uh... You know my brother was shot down recently? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, I heard about it. Bad show. Uh, he's a prisoner, isn't he? Yes, in Stalag Luft Three. Mm -hmm. uh, see on the map... Up here. Uh, uh huh. Sagan. Well, that's quite near the Polish border. Yes, yes, that's right. Now, Mickey, this is what I've been thinking. It's going on for Christmas. The boys in that camp will be cold and hungry and dreaming of home and mother. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Well, Mickey, on Christmas Day, we're going to drop parcels to the boys in Stalag Luft 3. That's an idea and a half. Uh, it's a long way, though. Oh, I've worked it out. It's well within our cruising range. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, how are we going to find it, sir? I, I mean, a small place like that, a and at night. I won't have to, old boy. Going by day, Christmas morning. But... By day? Yes. Oh, now, wait a minute. A uh, night hop's bad enough, but... But, I mean, to say in broad daylight... Well, it... Don't worry, Mickey. We can do it. Nip in over the Baltic at low level and surprise them. We'll, we'll get away with it. Hmm. Uh, how many aircraft? Well, three ought to be enough. 
Who? Well, me, uh, you, and either Shannon or Munro. Oh, I see. What sort of food were you thinking of taking? Oh, well, well things like chickens and raisins and uh, uh, chocolate, uh, some booze. Well, it'd give the boys a hell of a lift. Well, we'd better address a few boxes to ourselves. We'll be there too, you know, uh, on the ground or under it. Oh, I, I don't think it'll be that bad, Mick. We'll paint the aircraft white, put red crosses over them and, and, and take out the guns. What, no guns? No. It's a mercy flight. God have mercy on such as we. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, Mick, what about it? Uh, will you be in it? Oh, sure, sure. Yes, I'll be in it, sir. Six feet by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> 